Good morning, everyone. When we arrived in um, London yesterday morning, the pilot was very happy to announce that um, it was a wonderful, beautiful summer's day in London. And when I got off the flight, it was nine degrees. <laughs> and I've just come from South Africa where it is winter, and I left the country uh, with a temperature of 15 degrees, and that was um, cold to us. So. Um, I am still pleased that the weather is very pleasant in London, at least it's not raining. A friend of mine also sent me a message to say that he was at the beach this weekend <laughs> and even saw some sun. So um, we are very thankful for that. Um, thank you for the opportunity and thank you for the invitation. Uh, uh, it's, it's always lovely to talk about what happens in South Africa and around the world, but um, sometimes it's not always good to hear the side, the other side, as Sue said, she was speaking from the profession's perspective and I will be talking to you uh, from, the regula from a regulatory perspective. And my, my range of, of, of topics are also very wide. So I'm also going to try and keep it at a very high level. I've been asked to talk about landscape changes uh, in the profession, uh, creating a more competitive environment and the implications thereof, but uh, bearing in mind that it is from a regulatory uh, perspective. Before I start, um, I also had to do a presentation recently to um, a group of people, um, young, young accountants, and um, I had to talk about the different generations and the changes in the generations as it pertains to the auditing profession. And not knowing or understanding the new generations very much, that the gap is a little bit too wide, I had to go and get a book to explain to me what the different generations were and how they responded, how they reacted, um, how they fit into the new environment, into the working place, which was very different to how we used to go to work and, and, and what motivated us. So I, I bought a book called Mind the Gap, and you might want to read it when you get a chance. It's by Graham Codrington and Sue Grant Marshall. And it explains the different generations and what motivates them, how they differ from each other, and um, how they fit into the working environment. But in the book, they also talked about the different cycles that the generations go through, which is very similar to the cycles that I'll be talking about now when I um, refer to the current and the past financial crisis that we have been experiencing. And it's interesting how the different generations also have to fit into these cycles that the world goes through. But in the book, they talk about a historical cycle of crisis. And I know it sounds very negative, but unfortunately that is how it is. There's always some crisis and something happens in between, and then there's another crisis. But when uh, uh, any generation goes through a crisis, they then proceed to go into an era of um, individuals who are very outer-driven. And you can read about this in, in this book, they explain it very well. From there, it goes to a generation who wants to unravel their dreams. From there, they go to an inner-driven era, and that leads to another financial crisis, or to another crisis. Right? So it goes through different cycles, but this is just the generations, not finance. But it's interesting how finance fits into that as well. Um, just to, to set the background and explain again the perspective of my presentation, when we look at audit failures, um, it would help the uh, profession to focus on, on very different areas and, and the professions would normally respond to financial crisis. But when regulators respond, it is really because we have a responsibility to protect the public interest and to protect investors. So whatever response you'll see from regulators will be focused on what do we do to Sure, ensure and to give the assurance to the public and to investors that we can still protect their interest when there's a financial crisis. We also continue, and I know the profession does, we always continue to strive for, for high audit quality. And in the various inspections report that are, reports that are public, that are made public by the International uh, uh, um, Forum of Independent Audit Regulators and different regulators, the FRC in the UK, the RBA in South Africa, you'll see that we always focus on driving high audit quality. So that has become a focus of our attention as well. Governments and regional structures have issued uh, regulations, um, I, I'm referring here to the 8th Directive, to also strengthen public protection and um, secure the independence of auditors because when there's a financial crisis or a business failure, 
on audit failure, the focus is always on auditors. And the first thing that we look at is the independence of auditors. And that's why you'll see the world going through phases where they will do or implement measures to strengthen auditor independence. And stricter, aud or, or, uh, stricter measures currently is the order of the day globally and in South Africa. And of course, although in South Africa we don't slavishly follow what happens internationally, we have to align ourselves to what happens um, globally and look at what the best practices are and see how we will um, uh, implement those practices in South Africa. So the environment in which we operate uh, as a regulator is always changing. The profession, um, uh, the investors, uh, the, 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 the world in which we live continues to change. And I don't think that we've ever lived in a time and an era where there were so many changes and so quickly. But the principle that I always come back to, and when, when we address the auditors in South Africa, we always explain to them when they wonder why it is that we want to strengthen regulation and we think that stronger regulation will help the country or help the world get out of a financial crisis. But the principle that we have to remember is that by promoting integrity in financial reporting and building a basis for providing confidence, auditors reduce financing costs and contribute to the efficiency of the capital markets, thereby promoting economic growth. And as Sue said earlier, we were talking about integrated reporting. And in fact, um, in, the, in, the, in the papers produced by the working group, they've introduced a concept called trust, which I found very interesting. And, and that definition that I've just read also is to strengthen the trust of investors and of the public in financial reporting. So in financial crisis, it becomes particularly important to ensure that we have a profession that is strong enough and in which the, the public can have confidence is regulated to the extent that um, high quality audits are produced and reliable information is available for investors to take important decisions. During financial crisis, it's particularly important that they don't take the wrong financial decisions. And to that definition also, something that Sue said, I just want to add and I'll add going forward, is to build sustainable economies. Mm -hmm. So I think that gives you the big picture. But what is the impact of this on the audit industry? First of all, the perceived value of audit. I like the slide that talked about be part of the solution because currently audit is, as you are aware, seen as a grudge purchase. And it's not only the profession's responsibility to ensure that audit is seen as a not just another commodity that they have to buy, um, but seen as a service that adds value. And similarly, as a regulator, we, although our, our primary responsibility is to protect the public and investors, we are also still the custodian of the profession. And in that role, we still have to also ensure that, we, uh, that the public understands what the value of an audit is. Of course, advances in technology um, uh, and, and, and the new digital revolution, uh, we can't ignore that. That is not only happening at the clients, it's happening in the audit firms and therefore the regulators also have to respond to that. Um, we can't have standards that do not address um, how you perform an audit in the new environment which is driven by technology. There's greater access to data. Auditors have to realize that when they, when they audit a client. And of course, even we have to realize when we perform an inspection on an audit firm, we have greater access to data. And in fact, when we go in and do an inspection, sometimes we have more information about the client of an auditor than the audit firm does, because there's just so much information available. And that can be a bad thing, but it can also be a good thing. There's opportunities for differentiation for audit firms. If uh, the, the, the clients are seeing audits as commodities, which is a bad thing, I think it also should provide an opportunity for the audit firms to then use that to differentiate their product. And what we've also already seen in the um, uh, improved auditing report, audit reporting standards, um, the key audit matters, we've already noticed how audit firms use the key audit matter paragraphs to differentiate themselves from other, from other firms. The more information you make available, the more happy your clients would be. We also have to look at the quality of resources. Um, uh, the, the, the way and, and the type of students that qualify these days as auditors are very different. The qualities are very different. The expectations are very different. But we also feel that maybe the new generation coming through might not be as strong in auditing as we used to be. Well, I'm not saying that we were good. I'm just saying the previous generation, we were really trained in a very different way. And we have to be responsive to the type of auditor that are, auditors that are coming through. And of course, there's the increase in non-audit services, and that also diminishes the, the, the value of an audit. 
Just very briefly, the kinds of things that we are looking at at the moment um, uh, that has changed in the auditing environment. You have retendering and audit firm rotation. South Africa has just, re has just introduced mandatory audit firm rotation um, uh, in, in July this year. And that also clearly has an impact on the way that auditors run their businesses, but also on the way that businesses operate. If they have to change auditors every so many years, then um, they also have to adapt what they do. And I'll come back to the reasons why South Africa introduced this, um, which again um, brings, will bring me back to independence. There's recognition across borders. Um, we in South Africa, we would like to think that our uh, chartered accountant qualification is recognized worldwide. But uh, at the beginning of the year, we had a call from um, one of our partners, a KPMG partner from Cape Town, who was who had to sign off an audit report in the UK. And the regulator in the UK didn't allow them to sign off. And when they picked up the phone to us, they said, this is not possible because we are, our qualification is so good. How is it that we cannot sign off audit reports in, um, in the UK? But of course, it always comes back to legislation. Similarly, nobody, no, no, no auditor other than a South African auditor can sign off audit reports in South Africa. But what we realize is that we have to now enter into agreements different regulators, different institutes, to ensure that our auditors can move globally and sign off audit reports anywhere. There's no borders anymore. We live in a global world. Therefore, we have to enter into agreements to ensure that we recognize each other's qualifications because, the, as you know, the youth also wants to be mobile. The International Education Standard 8 recognizes that audit is no longer just, you don't need competences to be an accountant anymore. In South Africa, you first qualify to be an accountant, and then you have to do, besides your three years articles at an audit firm, an additional 18 months to um, uh, obtain practical experience to becoming an auditor. Um, and we recognize that to become an auditor, you need specialist competencies. It's not the same as just being a generalist accountant. And therefore, the Education Standards Board of IFAC, the standard IS8 also recognizes that you need additional competencies. So in the, in the past, when you were an accountant, and I know in the UK and some countries it's different, we don't even need an accounting qualification to become an auditor. But in South Africa, we've now recognized that uh, auditing is a specialist um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, profession, and therefore you, we, we also expect that you have additional competence. And clearly that will impact on the type of individual that comes through as an auditor at the end of the day. Where audits are done are also, have also changed. There's a lot of offshoring, there's outsourcing, use of data technicians, centers of excellence. You all know how that works. But um, the audit is no longer done at the client. Uh, if you're in London and you have a client in London, they might outsource some of the work to a company in India. And all of those factors have to be taken into account when you do the audit and when we do the inspection of the audit firm. We all talk about big data and data analytics. I don't know what that is, but um, everybody talks about it, and we know that it's a reality. <laughs> Pyramid staffing model has changed. In the past, you had, currently, you've got the partner at the top and a big audit team at the bottom. But with audit becoming a specialist function and the complexity of audits and the complexity of business and clients, we also recognize that maybe that pyramid will be changed in the future where you need the partners to be more, they have to be more partners at the top and fewer people at the bottom. So that might also have an impact on the audit teams that we see going forward. The governance structures of the firms, I know the FRC has also issued um, uh, papers and I think requirements to, for more transparency about the governance structures of the audit firms. Some of the audit firms, I think PwC in the United States now have more lawyers than they have auditors in their structures. And that is because of the world that they operate in. They have to defend themselves all the time. So instead of appointing more auditors, they have more lawyers. And because um, uh, the bus business is, co is complex, um, uh, a lot of the audit firms are appointing people with, um, who are specialists in, 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 in areas other than auditing and accounting. So those are just um, what I've been talking about, the kinds of things that we've, be, that we've seen changing in, um, in our auditing and accounting landscape. Right, uh, if I can then go on to the creation of a competitive marketplace, and again, um, 
I, I can't speak from an audit firm's point of view because I'm not at an audit firm, but I can speak from the point of view of a regulator. And our concern is always, um, as, as an audit regulator, that we have to ensure that there's enough competition in the market because should another big four firm fail, then the, there must be some other audit firms that can step into their position. Otherwise, we'll be left uh, with another failure. We'll be left with three audit firms globally. In South Africa, we have the big four. I think elsewhere there's the big six. Remember, it used to be the big eight. So as a regulator, we have to always be concerned about uh, the possibility of a big firm failing. And in a later slide, uh, I will show you some articles just from the last, I think this is just in 2016. These are the audit failures globally that we've seen and the amounts that the audit firms are being sued for. I think the Netherlands fines, uh, uh, that was very recent. We saw the, uh, um, the fines in America for, for the big four. And uh, um, we have to be, as a regulator, if, if we are responsible, we need to take cognizance of these um, uh, developments in the auditing environment. And we will be concerned that should a big four, four firm be sued for these kinds of money, um, uh, uh, their going concern might be at risk. We are not saying that uh, there's, there's such a risk at the moment. Uh, but clearly, as a regulator, we must be prepared and aware of that. So. We have to think of the audit failures, um, uh, what happens when there's an audit failure, and keeping in mind that an audit failure, a business failure, doesn't mean there was an audit failure. We see any business failure as a failure in the system. We, we talk about systemic failures, not a, a business failure or an audit failure. Sometimes a business failure means there was an audit failure, but not all the time, and we rather look at it as a systemic failure. We've seen the situation with Deutsche Bank uh, recently. I've shown you the, the fines payable by audit firms. And of course, there's the market concentration and dominance of the big four in the market. Now, in other countries, um, you'll hear the regulators talk about breaking up the big four. In South Africa, we're not talking about breaking up the big four firms. We think we need the big four firms. But we certainly need to create an environment where there's access by the other firms to the audit market. Because if something happens to those firms, somebody has to step in and take over those clients. Right? Otherwise, the market will be at risk. And therefore, we are trying to create opportunities for what we call the next year firms to step in and to have the capacity to be able to do the audits currently done by the big four firms. As a regulator, we will never encourage an, an audit firm to be appointed to a client which they haven't got the capacity or the competence to audit. But if you qualify as an auditor in South Africa, you are qualified to audit. It doesn't matter whether you're at a small or a big firm, you're qualified to audit. But we also recognize that there are different industries in which only some of the firms have specialist competencies, like banks. And there we understand that um, we need to deal with them slightly differently. So the market concentration and the dominance of the big four is a concern to us, but we need to think of how we address that. In South Africa, we are, are, are starting to follow a, um, a, a, the same model as the FRC in the UK, where we're looking at comprehensive regulation, where we want to incorporate not only the regulation of auditors under the IRBA, but also the regulation of all accountants, maybe company secretaries, maybe internal auditors, forensic auditors. And the reason that we want to do that is because um, when there is a systemic failure or a business failure, government doesn't have to go to five or six different regulators to try and address the problem. They can go to one regulator. And the World Bank has recommended that we follow the same FRC model in the UK. Last night I attended a presentation by the FRC. Um, they have now been appointed as the competent authority in, in, in the UK following the eighth directive. I think they were always the, the comprehensive regulator, but we will follow the same model in South Africa, and that is how we need to address business failures and systemic failures. Those are the measures that have been introduced by regulators, and uh, when it comes to GARP, also, um, uh, I recently read a book by Professor Baruch Lev and Feng Gu. It's called The End of Accounting, where they talk about the fact that we, uh, accounting is also part of the problem. And the accounting standards are also part of the problem because they report on historical information. And when we start moving towards integrated reporting and, report, and reporting on future, which has its own challenges, but the investors and the public 
are asking, they, they'd rather want to know when a business is in trouble. They don't want to know when the business has been in trouble and some of the reports on that. And currently our accounting standards refers to historical information and not future information. And if you read this book, The End of Accounting, you'll see that the suggestions that they make is to not expense important items, important in today's world, research and development, IT, skills of, of, of staff. Those things can't be expensed as salaries anymore because then you lose it. Those are the things that should actually be capitalized because those are the new assets in the new world. And they're saying that instead of putting it through the income statement, those should go to the balance sheet. That is just at a very high level. But other things that they say uh, should be capitalized are patents, brands, technology, innovations. We cannot just write those off anymore because the world now and companies live on technology and on changes in technology. There's changes in reporting, inclu including integrated reporting. Um, South Africa has, has uh, we, we're fortunate to be part of the IWSB working group on that, and Sue's also on that working group. And um, uh, there, again, we're looking at how we provide assurance on a very different type of report. Um, the new key audit matters in, in, in the ISAs. Also, the fact that investors can now get more information, there's more transparency. That means that auditors also have to change how they do things and be more transparent about how they do things. So that is just, uh, the next few slides are really just to show you the reasons why we as, as the RBA in South Africa had to look at market concentration, we had to look at the lack of competition in the market. That is what our audit market looks like for, 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 for listed companies and I know that it's not different in, in, in other countries and I think the UK, I spoke to um, the FRC last night, they're very similar, over 90% audited by the big four firms and that's where you can see the rest of our firms are. And clearly, somehow they've got to, we've got to open access for them into the market. The order tenor, we looked at order tenor of the big companies, and, and these are the kinds of things, I, I'm not going into the detail because my presentation is not on mandatory audit firm rotation, but these are the reasons why we had to introduce mandatory audit firm rotation in South Africa. These are the things that exist at the moment. You have the big public listed entities with <coughs> audit tenors for over 90 years, over 72 years. And if you look at the fees, uh, you can understand why those firms are also not willing to, um, why they're resisting um, to give up those kind of clients. Um, but these are the reasons that we, these are the things that we have to look at as a regulator. The threats to independence, um, uh, just very briefly, familiarity threat between CFOs and auditors. We found an 18% correlation between FDs and the audit firms which were appointed. We found a 25% correlation between the audit committee members and chairs and the firms where they came from. It's not to say there is an independence problem, but there could be a perceived independence problem. And as you know, as accountants and auditors, uh, perceived independence is just as important as, as real independence. In South Africa, we also had a bank failure, the African bank failure, and we're investigating the audit firms at the moment. In that, in that example, um, and this is public knowledge, we found that uh, three of the four audit committee members were from the same firm that audited the bank. And we're not saying that that caused the failure of the bank, but we certainly have to look at those kind of things. In South Africa, our inspections report, which is public, also shows that uh, in the top five findings, we have um, mostly auditors behaving unethically, and of course, independence is part of ethical behavior. Audits performed by the Auditor General in South Africa, um, I think it's the same in the UK. Audits are contracted out to the private firms, and we find that when the Auditor General took back those audits and audited themselves, because they're too small to audit all the uh, big um, uh, p public uh, public entities, and when they take them back, we find that it moves from a unqualified audit report to a qualified audit report, and that just demonstrates again that a fresh pair of eyes um, on an audit uh, in an audit could also make a difference. Right, that shows the share price of Deutsche Bank. I think you're all familiar with that. <laughs> um, Forty years of crisis. Um, uh, uh, I'm almost done. Okay. <laughs> um, 40 years of crisis, and uh, here again, i sorry to refer you to so many books, but there's another book by William Rose called Banker to the World. 
and uh, where he lists all these, the periods that we went from, from one financial crisis to the next. And I go back to my first slide where I talked about the cycle of crises in the different generations. But similarly, in our finance world, we've moved from these different crises and there's various reasons and different reasons behind them. But what he says in his book is that there is some, some commonalities between all these crises. And it comes back to poor regulatory oversight, dodgy accountant, accounting, herd mentalities, and in main, many cases, a sense of infallibility. Um, also, each economy thinks that they're different to the previous economy, so they don't learn from the lessons of the previous um, financial crisis because they think they're different, but actually they should just look at what what they can learn from the previous crisis. I think a lot of countries should rather, instead of looking at lessons learned from a crisis, what countries should be doing is to start or do research to see how they can have early warning signs um, of, of, of a financial crisis approaching. Um, and certainly there must be by now a lot of research that, that we can use to say, when we see this happening, we must be aware that there might be financial, a financial crisis coming. Right on digital versus regulation. Um, again, because I'm not from the current generation, I don't really know what that means. Um, <laughs> but I quickly looked at the encyclopedia, and it says digital means something using digits, um, which was a zero and a one in my days. I don't know what it means today, but clearly we don't. We have to know what digital actually means um, and how the world has changed. I think it's a lot more complex than just zeros and ones or talking in binary language. But uh, we have to ask ourselves the question, is there too much reliance on IT? We understand that it will change the way that you audit. We understand it will way to change the way that we regulate. There's, there's a lot of reliance on IT and we can know, I think in our days there, was, there were uh, approaches to audit around the black box, through the black box. Um, I think those concepts are no longer relevant. Um, uh, we are now auditing the black box. And it means that the skills of auditors will also have to change. There's obviously data overload. Um, our concern as a regulator is that audits are now driven um, through uh, methodologies and systems. And with the global firms, there's one methodology. And we are told in South Africa when our auditors follow a certain approach, this is the global methodology. We can't change it. But it also takes away that thinking audit. Um, we, 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 we find that auditors don't seem to think too much about what they're doing anymore. And there's less and less professional skepticism. Um, on Saturday, I'm going to the uh, I'm, I'm on the professional skepticism working group of, of the IWSB, and we're struggling at the moment to see how we can try to focus auditors' attention to be more professional, professionally skeptical again. Because I don't think auditors are professionally uh, sufficiently uh, skeptical when they perform an audit. And I specifically want to be on this working group as a regulator because we want auditors to be more skeptical, ask more questions, don't just follow the methodologies. And in South Africa, we talk about right touch regulation. We agree that there's over-regulation at the moment, but we come from a period where there was under-regulation or self-regulation. But we have to get to a situation where we have right to touch regulation. So what are the implications of this? Um, there's now auditors have to have industry and client specific knowledge. I say that transactions are much more complex. It's difficult to attract the right people to our profession. Cost of business and of audit has changed. Um, it's, it's, it's increasing. Um, uh, we have to understand that our businesses operate uh, um, across various uh, uh, jurisdictions. And firms have a global infrastructure, so we can't look at, at firms in isolation anymore. All of this is, has created, again, another expectation gap. Um, wider assurance is required. Um, we don't want audits to be compliance driven. There's more other assurance providers providing the kinds of assurance. It doesn't mean that only auditors can provide assurance on integrated reports. There's other service providers doing that. And at the end of the day, everybody is looking for value add. So those are the kinds of competencies that we see in our program. If you qualify as an auditor, we're working these kind of competencies into our qualification these days, um, taking into account wider assurance and the fact that auditors must have more augmented skills. Um, and those are the kinds of things that we're building into our qualification to become an auditor. And I think in closing then, um, if I can go back to my book on the generation gap, or mind the gap. Um, where we are at the moment with our generations is 
The society and economies are in a low. There's a current societal low period. And I'm just trying to predict where we are and what kind of people that we, we, we're going to be getting going forward. We are, in a, we are in a period of financial gloom and market turbulence. Normally after that, it, it's normally followed by an upswing in mood and experience. So I think things are looking brighter going forward. The next generation will be born into this era. And the new age of scientific inventions will hopefully fuel economic growth and global improvement. Thank you very much.